it for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line To my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us. to listen to the sick podcast Podcast. with tony maradero 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time boston four montreal three 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> there is a ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la bonne chose. Et c'est la bonne chose. Ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. Stanley pour les Canadiens. Le match troisième de l'histoire. You found the dogs. John, you found the dogs. He found the dogs. And all together, they worked a young team to the top. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground. Your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. Matt O'Han on this Friday afternoon, we're going to say, and we're going to get to that in a second with you on the sick podcast. It's Friday afternoon for me. It's about 10 05 Eastern time for you. Uh, the reason for it being uh, the afternoon is because we're pre recording. Listen, it's the summer. What we're going to do is to sometimes it's harder to reach guests at night during the summer. So what we're going to do is sometimes we're going to pre-record episodes. As you can notice, there's some sunlight peering into my room, into my, on my face. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, to bring you the quality guests, sometimes we got to move things around and we adjust. But the reason why we're still going to be uh, broadcasting this live at 10 p.m. is because we know you guys like to uh, chit-chat over on over in the live chat, debate some topics, and uh, comment live as things happen, as uh, you know, me, Tony, or the guests speak. So that's the reason for the pre-record uh, today. Uh, but we still will be broadcasting live at 10 p.m. Anyways, okay, the Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. They have been recently named by Deloitte and CIBC as one of Canada's best managed companies, the country's leading business award, recognizing innovative and world-class companies. The best managed Canadian companies designation fuels Energy's, trans, uh, Energy's purpose of creating progress for our customers, our employees, and our communities. Join a winning team and check out Energy's career page for available opportunities. We're also brought to you by Playground, your premier gaming destination. Playground's Summer Million is the must-play poker event of the season featuring 10 championship ring uh, events, $1 million in guaranteed prize pools, and a $500,000 guaranteed main event. Located just over the Mercier Bridge, only minutes away from downtown Montreal. Also brought to you by uh, La Bite at TV Beer, brewed in Quebec and a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bite at TV offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bit at TB, embrace your true nature. And finally, by Murphy Clinic. Uh, Murphy Clinic is an aesthetic clinic specializing in medical aesthetic care. They offer permanent laser hair removal as well as a wide range of treatments for skin problems such as acne, rosacea, fine lines, and more. They currently have two clinics, one located in Montreal's Shop Ang. Angus and our second on the North Shore in Terrebonne. They are also opening soon in Quebec City. Visit murphyclinic.ca or on Instagram at Murphy Clinic. Okay, now that my reading comprehension skills have been put to the test, we can put that aside. We welcome in our Friday guest. You know him as an assistant coach for Les Carabins de, de l'Université de Montréal, also former assistant and video coach in the KHL with Torpedo Nizhny. He is Mitch Jaguer. Mitch, how are we? I'm good. Je vais bien. And you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, I, you know, the, the sun is kind of trying to shine. Eh, I, not really. Sun is well, out here. It? I don't know where you're from, but right here, I can see it from my window. Okay, yeah. We're Beautiful. trying to get the sun. But hey, it's better than what we were promised, which was rain. I'll take yeah, this over rain. I do agree. Um, are you going to be enjoying any of the F1 festivities this weekend? Uh, I'll say no because I'm working. We 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 got we have our I'll say training camp, but it's not a training camp. We don't have training camp in the university, but we have uh, our camp this uh, this weekend starting tomorrow and Sunday. So it's gonna be off ice and on ice uh, testing. 
Uh, it's going to be a, a great way to get together with uh, with the team because the last time we were all together was March 19 when we lost to the bronze mm. medal. Um, so it's going to be good, but sadly, I'll probably just try to watch here and there uh, because we're going to spend mostly 10, 11 hours at the rink uh, Saturday and Sunday. You know what? It's better that way. The downtown is a mess. Getting there is a mess. I don't care what anyone says. The metro system yeah. is now flooded. It's crazy. I was there. Uh, I was downtown yesterday. It was, it was bonkers. I went. Um, I went there. I, I went to Laval yesterday because I bought my new car. So I went there, and coming back, it was, it was a nightmare. Yeah. I. I mean, listen. I sat on to carry and just driving through through St. Henry to Griffin Town to meet up with some friends. Not even driving through downtown. It took me 45 minutes yeah. to to do that drive, which it usually takes 15 to 20. It was yeah, no, it's a nightmare. It was nuts. Um what isn't a nightmare is drafting fifth overall in the, the NHL draft. Um I don't even okay, where do we start? Because the Canadians, you know, last week no chance they're drafting Mitchkov. Uh, then they were guaranteed to draft Ryan Leonard. Then they were guaranteed to draft uh, Reinbacher. Now they're trying to trade up. They're trying to trade down. They're trying to go sideways. And now they're interested in Mitchkov. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about Mitchkov. It's uh, it's such a hot potato. Like I mean, let, let's go back what a year ago. At the U18, if I'm right, when he was there, it was like I remember on tw on Twitter and Facebook and all social media, it was always like Bedar against Mishkov, and Mishkov was like mm. at that moment, at that showcase tournament, it was better. And like I remember pictures, and and everyone was like, okay, he might have a chance to go, you know, to go first. Uh, mm. Let's move back. We all know what happened in in, in Russia. Obviously, it's, it's it's not cool at all. But since then. Honestly, even if I'm if I'm a coach, even if I have connection over there, even if I talk with players that are playing with him and coaches who coach him, we just at the moment right now we don't know. And the sad part, uh, and, and I'm not saying I'm not pointing finger at anybody. It's like that every single year with the draft is when you're getting closer to the NHL draft two months, three months prior to. You always have people that have, I'll not say knowledge, but they know somebody, sources, and they just start throwing players under the bus without any kind of real verification about if it's r real or not. And, and sometimes I'm just there watching, listening, and I'm like, oh, man, what, what, a, what a gong show, you know? Mm -hmm. So just going back with Mishka, like what – Obviously, we will never know the truth about everything, and I, I don't want to go in deep in, in, in that, but we, we will never know the truth about what's real, what's not. Uh, if he really wants to pick his team, like that will probably be one of the first NHL player guy to do it. Like here in the Quebec Major Junior, most of the players are saying, oh, I want to go NCA so I can keep my – my routes and blah blah, but basically they're no matter what they are getting drafted in thirteen round pick, thirteen round. So they are not good enough mm -hmm. to be to play in the NCAA. So it, it it's so hard. What's and like how many times a day we talk about him? Like <laughs> like I'm not even listening to the radio and I'm still hearing voice and everything talking about him. And because people know I'm a coach. People know I was in Russia. They're like, what do you think? And is it real or is it not real? It's like I will not love to be in the Montreal shoes until mm -hmm. that NHL draft. And and the thing that we – I'll, I'll say people have to understand the NHL teams knows way more than anybody here, basically, because they have contacts. They, they follow the kid. They follow – is agent since years. So they have informations that we don't know. They probably have they probably doesn't know some stuff as well because of Russia and how they try to keep stuff within them. But it's so hard. And going back with the fifth pick, um even last year with the first overall pick, like a couple of weeks ago, get let's go back in time, a couple of weeks prior to the draft, we were hearing People saying, oh, Montreal might draft and just go back a couple of picks just to, 
we're like, okay, it's always like that every single year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and even there, even now, who's going to be the second pick? And who's going to be the third? To be honest with you, it, it is so good that you don't know. So you might want to trade up for a player that might be available at the fourth or the fifth pick, you know? Mm-hmm. And you might try to trade up to be the third pick overall, let's say. And uh, the team who's going to talk second is going to pick him. Because obviously mm-hmm. you got Bidar, but after that, you, you have some decent players. And you might you might see some teams taking a chance on, on Mishkov. But I will, you, and you know what? Just to close on that before, I will not be surprised to see him going in the top five. But I will not be surprised as well to see him moving outside the top 10 mm. for millions of reasons. Millions. Well, and that's the thing, you know, it's when we look at the Canadians specifically, it just feels like, you know, last week when when Kent Hughes spoke, he said so, he was faced with some questions on Mitchkov. And, you know, I really felt like the more he spoke about him, the more the Canadians were not going to draft him. And I, and I kind of still am in that camp. Um, I really don't think they will as much as people want them to. And when that report came out that he's trying to trade up, that that to me was number one sign, flashing light. They're not going to draft him even if they stay at five and he's there because it kind of just feels like from that report, how I read it, I don't know how Tony read it, but how I read it was the Canadians know that they probably talent wise had, you know, had Mitchkov, there'd be no issues with coming over the contract issues and all that. No brainer. They'll, they'll take him. But with all this, they're not willing to take that risk and they just don't want to do it, but they know that they're going to face a lot of heat when they don't at five, if he's there. And no matter what they're going to do, they might face a lot of heat. I mean, let's say they picked him at fifth and he never show up. That mm. it's not like in the queue when a first rounder doesn't show up the year after you can, you have like the, the last pick of the first it doesn't work like that. You put all your money basically in that kid that you wish you hope that he's going to be a great player and especially him. Uh, so let's say you picked him, you draft him, you do everything you can, and you just say, no, I'm not coming. And in whatever years, you decide to come back, sign as a free agent, and you just lost the fifth pick overall when you know that the top 10, 15 is awesome. On the flip mm-hmm. side, you don't pick him. Okay, you, you, keep, you kept your fifth pick overall, you pass on him, and whoever is behind six, seven, or eight decided to pick him, and he show up. And he's he burn, you rolling on the league. Mm. It, it's not. An, it's there's there's no win win situation, but there's no lose loss loss situation. So, in my opinion, if the Montreal doesn't want to take a chance, or if the Montreal doesn't want or knows tough or things that okay, we are not taking him for whatever reason. They don't. They have to move up to trade up, or they have to trade mm. down. Because you don't want to, you don't want to, if you don't want to pick him, you cannot stay fifth overall because the backsplash or all the, the things that can go both ways, it's going to be, would you imagine in five years talking oh about Mishkov? Like we, we do that with every single year drafting when we didn't pick that guy or whoever is that guy. And we're always mm-hmm. coming back, circling back year after year. Oh, we should have picked that guy. Yeah, it's always easier after. Like Patrice Bergeron. Yeah, we should have picked him. But who who ever thought a second round pick would be like him? Like Pavelski, like we name it. Uh, mm. So for me, if, I, if I'm the GM and the whole scouting staff, GM, coaches, whoever is involved, we decide that we will not pick him if he's available. We try to trade up before, and if at the table he's it's the Montreal Canadian, it's your your own clock. Okay, Mishkov is still available. We try to trade down. Hmm. That's 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 what I will do if for they're sure they have reason to make that no not selection for sure. 
You know, all the, the comparison I'm going to make, it's it's a little different because he was a fifth round pick uh, the year he got drafted. But the comparison I would make is uh, that of Kirill Kaprizov. Um, because, you know, in his draft eligible year, played in the KHL, didn't do too well, you know, in 31 games, four goals, four assists. Uh, and then he started to pick it up. He yeah. stayed in the KHL for five more years after he was drafted. You know, like he... Five years is a long time, so Ken, that's like a big ask for Ken Hughes and co. to really try to convince a fan base. If he were to, let's say he's coming to Montreal, you know, whenever he's done with the KHL and whenever he's able to come, you know, with the whole Russia situation. Yeah. That's a, five years is a long time and a lot of things can change. So Five years but is I, long, but who knows that he's going to stay five? And and, and I, I touched base on it last week when I when I wrote an article. I, I was like, people, when when we draft now more than ever, even the first pick overall, more and more they should start or go back and at the junior level or pro level in Europe, or maybe having the chance to start in the American Hockey League because they are not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try to, people are talking, okay, why they don't send him back to the junior so they can spend a year or two, maybe even three years, let's say, go back two years, junior, one year of American Hockey League. So he's going to spend three more years before coming with the pro team and, and be ready and getting ready and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, people are like, no, we don't want Mishkov to be three more years in the KHL. Okay, what's, what's the difference between a guy playing in the, still now best the second best league in the world or going back playing 25 games in the NCAA or 60 something in, in, in the queue, what's the biggest difference? And if we look at Mishkov this year, Scott was not happy about his time on, on ice. So they trade him to uh, Sochi and mm -hmm. he put up uh, what 20 something points in 27 games. So that was not that bad. That was not that bad. And on the flip side, I don't remember who uh, – that's Daniel, who's the skills coach for, for Ska, and he's a friend of mine because I was with, with him at Hockey Canada. He put up names that played in Russia that was under contract. Obviously, it's before, before mm -hmm. what we know right now. But we had like uh, Barabanov, uh, Panarin, uh, Shishterkin, uh, Kuzmenko, who signed last year um, – mm -hmm in Vancouver, who was really good, by the way. So sure. you name like five or ten players that played in the KHL and, and even under contract, they finished, they, they were ready and they moved to North America and they have decent careers so far. Uh, but again, I'm happy I'm not Kent Hughes. To be yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, me neither. Uh, me too, because, uh, I mean, listen, I would like his pay. That's no question. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we would both like his pay. Uh, that's a question. But uh, this decision, you know, it, it, it's kind of hyperbole because every year we say, oh, it's the most important offseason. This is the most important selection they'll ever make. This one's a pretty big one because, you know, even even if let's just say, for example, Yuri Slavkovsky whiffs and, you know, he becomes 50 or 60 point player, uh, you know, at least you got service out of him. Yeah, getting nothing. You got a player, player that you drafted. At the end of the day, when you draft a player, no matter his rank, you want him to play in the NHL. That's the yeah. first. That's the first thing. When he's playing in the NHL on a regular basis, you can almost almost say hallelujah. You know. So I agree mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. Um. Let Let's talk about a little bit about the player on the ice. Um. You know, I've seen videos of what he's able to do. Uh, it's pretty incredible. You know, he's like a magician with the puck. I know that's like something we say about a lot of players. But really, I remember I saw one clip where he kind of faked a pass in the neutral zone on a breakout and then took it himself. Just really good at making space for himself. I know it's bigger ice over in Europe and in it's, and in Russia, um, but does that game kind of translate in the NHL with smaller ice? Um, we we have to think about the KHL. Everyone talk, thinks that the KHL it's all Olympic rinks. That's um, mm. that's the first thing. It, it's not true. 
half of them are NHL since uh, NHL size rink, and the other half is uh, Finland. So basically, mm. um, NHL is 26 feet, no meters. Uh, yep. Finland is 28, and uh, and uh, Olympic is 30. Okay? okay, so that's that's big change. Scott, they're playing on the NHL size rink, so he's already. Okay. You already understand what it uh, what it is to play on a smaller uh, smaller ice. It's the other thing too that we have to think about it is when they're younger. Yes, they have more time, they have more space, so they learn ways to skate with their eyes up. They have more time to make decision, so they can read their eyes better. They can make decision faster or slower because they have more time and space. And throughout the years, like I said, they're they're not playing on Olympic ring size. Like, mm -hmm. So they're getting along with understanding that, okay, today we're playing on, on a taller rank and tomorrow it's a smaller one. So it's not like back in the days that was all Olympics and they, the trend to translate was way harder. And even if you take like that U17, U18, U20, um when they are playing in canada they're all smaller same thing in us so depending uh but at the end of the day the good thing about him is he's playing in the khl he's playing against men yeah. like that way older like 25 30 32 35 years old players so they're stronger faster better um so for him obviously he will have to learn how to play the right way basically because KHL and NHL, it's not the same type of play. Uh, it's not the same skill set. It's not the same intensity, grind, and all that kind of stuff. But he was good everywhere he went. At the U17, U18, he will have been probably been amazing at the U20 if he was there. Um, so I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid that he will be an IN skill guy. But again, as like anybody, if he's playing on a, sorry to say that, but a shitty team with no players that will surround him, the team or the fans might not be happy, you know? Hmm. Yeah. And it, you know, it goes to, to him in, in that he might not want to play on a, on a crappy team either, which uh, we, w and we know, the, listen, what we know is that uh, barring a miracle, the Canadians are not going to be good next year. No. Uh, I mean, uh, unless something crazy happens, but does you have to go along with the vision of the team and, you know, if they want him to be ready, let's say in those three years that he said uh, that his contract will be up in uh, and he comes over here, you kind of, how, how much does it value? Does it add being in a development system of a team versus you know just playing in a league with men like that because you know there's some areas on his in his game that i'm sure he has to develop the nhl has played way differently than the khl and the canadians would want him to work like that but you know if he's playing over in the khl they have zero control over that so how much how much does that really factor in well i think it depends on on the organization and who's the coaching staff the skills coach and all that kind of stuff and and, and i'll give an example when i was in khl uh, in her team, Ilya Fedotov was a second round pick by the Arizona Coyotes. Okay, so uh, it was hard for the Arizona to travel because of the COVID and mm. and, and all that. So um, I reach out to Andre Turini and Mario Duhamel, and I say, "Hey boys, uh, I know it's hard for you, but I'm coaching one of your one of your prospect and." Uh, can we can we work together basically because even like language barrier could be hard because some coaches doesn't speak English at all. So uh, Mario put me in contact with uh, I just spoke with him yesterday. I don't remember his <laughs> uh, their skills coach. Yeah, and he said okay, yes. So we start chatting and he put me in contact with two other people from the Arizona and weekly me and them we were talking about how it went. Uh, what can what I've noticed on my end, what they've noticed on their end, how can we improve his skating, shooting, uh, IQ, whatever it was. So in practice, I was working with him before, after practice, uh, same thing in videos. Yes, for our team first in Nizhny Novgorod, but 
knowing that, okay, his dream is to make the NHL. So let's try to find the fine line between I'm going to try everything that I can to help the team with him to get to have success, but to help him as much as possible we can. Mm. So we develop him at the next level. So the communication was, like I said, with Mario and Andre was not (laughs) weekly because they were coaching and that's fine. They were not part of developing young players that are not in in the NHL teams. But with their skills coach and all the uh, players development and all those guys, uh, weekly we were talking together. So obviously they cannot say we want him to play that type or that way. But teams in the KHL are the same teams in the American Hockey League. If he's a skilled guy, we're going to try to put him in a skills Situation, situation basically. Mm-hmm. We will not try to put him as a fort liner, grinder, dump and chase who's afraid to go in the corner to ask him, go hit the guy in the corner. Plays the puck behind the giddy and go get him. No, it, it's impossible. And that's why I really enjoy what, or I really liked, I should say, what Scott did this year, trading him or loan him to Sochi so he could play mm-hmm. more ice time and play as a first liner and not fort line or outside the lineup because the reality is yes they have a great young players a great young player but he doesn't fit right now in their top nine because they are so good so you still you, you don't want to push somebody that it deserved to be there to just put a prospect there so uh but again if their communication is good with the khl team or uh sweden or whoever the guys from uh, you can you can make a lot out of it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I like what you said there about, uh, you know, how just Scott was so good that they just couldn't, you no. know, it, it it didn't make sense. No. Um, because that that's the other thing, too. Like, CSKA, they're, they're not a stupid team. They know that NHL teams want this guy. Yeah. And they want to win at the same time. So when he's ready, he'll play up in their lineup. So, yeah. you know, there because there are a lot of people out there that are saying, you know, I'm concerned about if he were to get drafted, that these teams are going to do everything they can to keep him in the KHL, that they're not even going to want him anywhere sniffing near a, an NHL roster. They're going to give him no ice time and all this stuff. And I'm like, what do you mean that they're going to give him no ice time? They're trying to win their own league. Yeah. You know, and, that, the, and, that, that's the part that, that messes me up. That's a part. And I'll go further. Um, everyone remember... Like I call him Kochi because it's his first and last name. It's so hard to, to pronounce. But he, <laughs> he's a goaltender that uh, he, he fought with us in the KHL, and I mean really fighting on the ice. He fought with the uh, uh, Carolina Hurricanes. I don't know if you remember. He was like going close to the, the opponent bench, and he was yelling at them, and he fought in, mm. the, in the American Hockey League. Uh, so he fought everywhere. So everyone remember him. He's a 22, 23 years old kid. So he was dra- like you don't draft in a KHL. So he was protected by uh, Scott, and mm-hmm. uh, he was the third or fourth goalie out there. So he didn't play. Okay. So we or my head coach Dave was know him, and he said we need a goalie. So he called Scott and he said, "Look, we need a goalie. Can we make an arrangement? Can we do something?" And they say, "Yeah, we're gonna." loan it to you just give us some money and you're gonna have him for the year so perfect he came with us the first year my first year was there uh let me see here i got his stats so he played uh six game for us 931 safe percentage in season and in playoff 932 so that was good that was Mm. really good and yeah it was a rookie the year after last two years ago uh 926 he finished the season for us again It was with Ska, but they loaned us for another year because they didn't have spot for him. Even they knew he's a second-round NHL guy. So what happened this year? They let him go. He played for Carolina and the Chicago Wolves. So he played 24 games in the NHL this year and 26 in the American Hockey League, and he's with Ska. Mm -hmm. So people doesn't like – they think about Mishka, but they – we still have to think bigger than that. They have one really good player. He's going to be a number one for Carolina probably next year. And yeah. they, they, they let him go without any issues. 
Yeah. Well, they and th- and that's it because they they just know that that's how hockey works. You know, players yeah. move on and they, and have other things. Um, and at the same time, for them, they can have they can keep having good players and young players. Yeah, exactly. Because they okay, they let him go to play in the NHL, so I can go there, develop, get better, and the day I'm good enough, I can move on. And it's it, it's a good way. It's a good job. Well, there you go. It's it's just the it, that's just the cycle of how it's done. I mean. To bring it back all all in, I mean, I just think for the for the Canadians right now at number five, uh, if you're not sold on the player, like I I personally I would probably take the chance. It's easy for me to say that when it's yeah. not my when it's not my ass on the line. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, it's a whole different ball game when you're Kent Hughes because if that blows up in your face, that's a, that's a fireable offense right there. Yeah, um, and you might never have might never had a second chance as well so that's why you and again there are how many scouts how many people that are working on that in that mm. on that case that so at the end of the day when they're going to make the decision to trade up trade down or pick him it's because they're 100 percent sure of their decision no matter what yeah. people are saying that's that's what people has have to think if when they're making that decision, it's because they're hundred percent sure. Now they cannot predict the future. So who knows? Who mm-hmm. knows? And these things happen all the time in the NHL draft. You know, they t- some some players are talked about like their future Hall of Famers, then they play, yeah. you know, 10 games in the NHL and their careers Sean, NHL career is over. Sean Couturier. That was not a long well, there time you go. ago. Uh, no, not Sean Couturier, but uh sorry, he's injured. Uh the other first round pick, the first pick overall by the, the Flyers. Mm, uh, by the fly, uh, well, there was Neil Yakupov by the Oilers. Uh, the yeah. first, there is uh, the first pick by the Flyers. Um, yeah, his uncle is coaching the Winnipeg guys that just got sold. By the way, uh, mm. uh, Patrick. Oh yeah, yes, Nolan. yes, Nolan, Nolan Patrick. Patrick. He was first pick overall, and two ranked after you got Colin McCarr. But again, they were hundred percent sure on that kid. And sadly, just didn't go well. So it's it's tough drafting. Yeah, it, 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 it's a science that no one knows. Well, that's it. there's just too many things that go into it. I mean, I, I know the leash is shorter in Montreal just because of the draft record of the pro of the prospects, and you know, people don't care that it's a new regime. It's the the patience is up. I feel like people just hear. They just want the the sure thing right away. You know, give me the give me the superstar that every team somehow manages to get, but not Montreal. Uh, anyways, let's move on uh, because this uh, was an interesting uh, article that came across my desk. Tony sent it to both of us. Um, the potential buyouts for the Canadians. Um, I don't know how you stand on buyouts, but me, generally speaking. I'm not a fan unless there's one year left and that's like worst case scenario because I think it's just wasted money. Um, I don't know. The the three candidates seem to be uh, Yoel Armia, Brandon Gallagher, and Mike Hoffman. You know, I, I remember talking earlier in the year around the trade deadline that Mike Hoffman would be a prime candidate for any team looking for a boost to their power play. It kind of looked like the Panthers could have used him in the Stanley cup final on their power play. Um, So, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of just having dead cap space. How do you, how do you stand on those, uh, those three players? Well, the cap space right now, it, everyone is so tight. Everyone is so tight that, it is really hard to move players at, at first. Like even with picks or young players, it is hard. After that, knowing that the cap space, most, I, I don't have the stats, but a lot of teams are really close to it. That means if you buy out a contract, you're going to have two years, three years, maybe four years mm-hmm. left with a dead salary on it. So it's, again, it's a fine line between what, what you want to do and what's your plan in the upcoming two years, three years, five years. Uh, if we let, let's go in order with all the names you, you said, Gallagher, Gallagher have mm-hmm. it, have it here. Uh, obviously, like his contract at first was was not good. Okay, let, let, let's yeah. put it that yeah. way. Uh, no one 
even if prior to he was oh he was getting uh, not sick but injured a lot, we we were hoping that he could keep up or keep his head above the water. But sadly, things didn't go well for him. But if we buy him out, that that means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. For the next eight years, the Montreal Canadian will have to reduce their salary cap by 2.29 million for eight years. So for mm -hmm. two or three years, okay, I can deal with it. Eight years, there it's impossible. So for me, if I'm the coach, I give him one more year, crossing my fingers that he'll be back at what he was before or close to. I don't think he's mm -hmm. able to get back because he's, man, that guy is a true warrior. He's but broken. His body, yeah. yeah, he's broken. And I, I don't know how many pieces, probably more pieces than bones that we have. But I'll give mm -hmm. him one more year because we all know him. We know how a true leader he is or close to a uh, great sportman. Like everyone talks about him highly. So give him one more year. If things doesn't work, it, it's not cool to say that, but I just hope he decided to just say, okay, my body say no, and I'm on the long-term injury list. Or yeah. I try to do everything that I can to trade him. But even there, the, his contract, you need somebody that has a lot of salary cap and somebody that is willing to take him on third or fourth liner and you're gonna what you're gonna give with him a first pick plus a, a prospect it starts to be a lot mm. so and, and you know the thing about gallagher because you you brought up two two points uh one was the ltir i think he's a prime candidate for that oh, yeah. uh, i'm pretty sure he is because... right now but he just doesn't say it well, that's it, you know, and he'll he'll play to he'll play till yeah. someone drags him off the ice. Yeah. You know, he's just that type of player. So, um, he he's prime candidate for that. The other interesting point that you brought up because I said this when the Canadians acquired initially Shea Weber, I said I, I guarantee he ends his he ends his career, you know, all things being equal back then as an Ottawa Senator because Ottawa was one of those teams that you know. They would never spend to the cap, and he had a high cap hit, but by the end of his contract, the last three or four years, if he was still playing, which obviously he's not now, but he's only getting paid in cash $1 million. Yeah. So you would think, based off that knowledge, that uh, you know Gallagher would be a prime candidate for Arizona, the money laundering team of the NHL, um, or an Ottawa, or any team that doesn't generally spend a lot of money. I just looked at his uh, at his numbers. He he makes five million cash. That's it. Uh, you know, six point five cash, five million cash. The, there's no uh, there's no uh, peak salary one year, and then it goes down. It's so I, I I don't see it happening for him, especially with the way Kent Hughes operates. With the you know he'll, he'd be under they'd be paying his uh, salary under years. the cap until yeah exactly. It's just I, I just don't see it. In, in today's NHL, I can't because, oh. you know, the, the Islanders did that with Rick DiPietro. They just, like, finished paying him a couple of years ago. Yeah, that was like wild. That. One million a year for, like, 15 years. <laughs> Can you imagine? Think about it. Two no. seconds. Like, you wake up every – was, what, June 1st or July 1st? You wake yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, oh, it's been 365 days that I didn't wear my skates and I didn't went on the ice. And, oh. One million because I am a hockey player. Wow, that's direct, nice. direct deposit from the uh, direct. from the New York Islanders. That's, that's amazing. Um, so Hoffman, let, let's talk Hoffman. Um, I could see it happening, but also at the same time, like I really didn't think he was as bad as people made him out to be last year. I, I think he's a serviceable guy for a team that has to have a plan for him. It can't just be, you know. Oh, we're going to throw him on the ice and play him in this situation. Like you have to know what you're getting. And I feel like teams know that already. And any team that has a power play, that's just missing that punch. I feel like they could use him. I feel like they would give, you know, it could be a fifth round pick. I don't care, but you know, I don't think paying him for two for an extra year makes much sense to me. Like the thing about him is since he's 15 years old, he doesn't know how to play without the puck. And he doesn't know how to play in his zone. And people 
start yelling at him because he's not good without the puck and because he doesn't know what to do in his own D zone. Yeah, but that guy was he's not a defensive player. He's he's a guy who can shoot the puck and hell yeah, he can shoot it. But last year, some decision with the puck in the offensive zone was not really good. So that's why people are start complaining and and, and I understand that. But Okay, he's winning, uh, have it here, five millions for one year. So if you buy him out, it's going to be for two years at 1.6. So 1.6, we honestly, I, I think every team in the league or even the Montreal can deal with that. It's only 1.6. But the question will be for why? Hmm. Why you will do that with a player who's only have one game, one year left, who was healthy scratch last year, and didn't do anything like for against the team and he was LT scratch and he was like okay I'm LT scratch and so now you're gonna buy him out you're gonna have his contract for two years while you know that this year you're gonna have you're gonna have money on the salary cap you're gonna you, you're not gonna be that close so if you if somebody wants him for like you said a fifth round pick okay let's go if you if you don't if you don't see him on your team because the other thing we have to think for the people around is no matter okay we want to trade him we want to trade drew we want to trade like nine nine forwards out of 12 yeah. who's going to replace them oh young players from the rocket or the american hockey league sorry to say that but there's a reason those guys are in the american hockey league you know it, it's sad to say but there's a reason so you're going to bring all of them in the NHL. Sorry to say that. It's going to be the worst se NHL season ever close to. So you still need players that can play in the NHL. And it's the same thing when older players, you're, you're asking why they're still in the NHL or why he's still with the team and they're not putting like a young player instead of him. Well, the young player is not ready yet. And the 35, 36-year-old guy... He's still able to have a spot um, in the lineup. So those reasons sometimes people doesn't understand or doesn't know that. If you're not happy about Offman, you can't trade him and you don't want him. Keep that five million. Send him to the American Hockey League. This is it. Like if he's mm -hmm. if that guy is a, is a problem around your team off the ice and you don't want him at all, just send him in the American Hockey League. That, that will be what I do. Like, you don't want him to try to trade him for whatever it is. Like you said, he could be a great power play guy. And he could be a, like a fort liner that doesn't play or only play on the power play. If one of your top nine players is out, you can, you can squish him there. Uh, but if you cannot find anything, just send him in the American Hockey League instead of buying him out. Because it's only one year left. And you're going to have a lot of money. Uh, you're going to save money for next year. Because starting next year... You're going to start signing players, signing some free agent, making some trade to get better. So you need as much as possible money or cap room uh, on your salary cap. And, and that's, you know, that's the thing, because as we we're, we're, we move on to Armia again, you know, one point uh, I just had it in front of me, uh, you know, he'll be on the books for four years, an average of we'll call it one point four. Uh, four million dollars it's not a terribly big amount of money but you know with the where the canadians are at it's just why you know like they're 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 not going to be good next year so next year is basically a write-off like they're going to be better than they were this year that's for sure um you know because they just won't hopefully won't have 10 million injuries um but just eat that one year, and if you really can't find a spot for them, then the year after, because you never know. Like, you might need that $1.3 million. Maybe that $1.3 million, if the Canadians are looking at him, is the difference between getting Pierre Luc Dubois and Pierre Luc Dubois going to another team. You know, yeah. that, that that's where, you know, oh, it's just 1.3, oh, it's just 0.5 million. That's where it comes in handy when you, you're you're being nickeled and dimed by a player. And or a team is nickel and dime, and you're in a bidding war, and you run out of cap space to play with. 
that's yeah. where it becomes the issue. So I just think with where the Canadians are at right now, I'd, I I know people want to accelerate this, but what's the one thing that happened when Kent Hughes came in? Everybody writing articles and the analysts and everyone out there said, it's going to be tough for three to four years. It's going to be painful. Well, we just went through year two. This was the first full year. You can't rush this process if you want it done properly. Otherwise, you're stuck in limbo like Toronto was for however many years before they won the lottery and got Austin Matthews. That's just yeah. the way I see it. And But if you ask me, you only have to buy out one guy for sure. Army is the first one. Like they're, Oh, for me, yeah, if you have to. If, yeah. if you have to. And again, I'm, I'm on cap friendly right now. And if we buy him out right now, it's going to be 1.4. Uh, 1.4 something uh, for four years. And if we buy him out next year, uh, instead, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be only for two years instead of four. And it's mm -hmm. going to be 1.2. So again, if I'm can't use, I'm going to sit down. Okay. What's our depth chart? You know, who's going to play on the first line? Who's going to play on the second? Who's going to play on the third? Who's going to play on the fourth line? Because, They're, they're like Drew I will probably not sign back. We'll probably not sign. Um, the guy that we trade for, um, Dadunov. Um, uh, oh my god, his name is escaping me now. Also, I'm sure uh, uh, people are Garyanov, whatever is Guryanov, Guryanov, Guryanov. You will probably not sign back. So, again, you need players that can play in the NHL mm -hmm. because Andre Turini always say it, and it's bad because this team doesn't, doesn't win. But you cannot build success when you're just losing or when you're out of the league team. So if you can play, and I don't like Armia, don't get me wrong. I, I only liked him when they made the uh, the Stanley Cup run. Yeah, the, and was, the, yeah, in the playoffs, he was he unbelievable. Was amazing. And when he's playing at the uh, national events, the events, because it's different. But it will be the first one. But again, you need players that can play in the NHL to show how to play to the other players. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful. And what is it to just keep him one more year? But I totally agree with you. And we look at the, uh, the final four this year, the NHL from, they had zero taxes. Mm -hmm. That's, that mean, Here in Montreal, we have, I don't know how much exactly, but it's if, about, we'll call it 50%. So if a guy like, oh, oh yes, don't get me wrong. They're making millions. Okay. They're, they're making millions. Yeah. But if you can sign a contract in whoever team for 10 millions, and at the end of the day, your paycheck is going to be 10 millions or roughly two, or you can go in Montreal, same contract, but at the end of the day, you have half. What are you going to do? So let's I'm, say I'm I'm taking my bags and I'm going to Florida with the nice so weather. Let's too. say you let's say you're making a uh, hundred thousand a year. Okay, so you can you make a hundred thousand a year, or you can do the same job in Vancouver, but for 50. What are you going to do? Staying here. I'm so staying it, home. It's the same thing for the NHL players. Yes, they're the only difference is they're making more money, but they're they're only having half. So. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really important to, when the time will come, to keep as much as possible money so they can sign players because contract will just get higher and higher. They, mm -hmm. they will get bigger. So you need as much money as you can. And notice every single year when they're calling up somebody, sometimes they just call, they, they send him down right after so they can save like a loony here or a toony here. Like, just to save like a penny that mm -hmm. that's amazing so oh yeah just buy him out him and him and him like they're sending down a player to save like 50 bucks okay that's probably more but you know what i mean now yeah. okay, let's buy out those three guys for seven millions for one year two years and eight years well it doesn't it doesn't work like that Well, that's it. You know, it's just that's that's one of the games that, you know, it's and it's an advantage that the Canadians have, I find, with being, you know, as as bad as they are. Yeah, um, it is. So and they should take advantage of the time to just 
eat those years off those contracts. You know, that, that, that's what it is. You do, it's, the, it's a frustrating way, but it's, it's kind of the right way because you just give yourself more time because uh, I, I promise fans one thing. If they buy out uh, Armia, if they buy out Gallagher, if they buy out Hoffman, I promise you they're not making the playoffs this year. And if they do, and if they don't do it, same thing's going to happen. They're not going to make the playoffs. So it's take this year, take a breath. I know people want action, but uh, take a breath and uh, just you know ride this wave out and enjoy the good moments like we did last year. You know, I've never yeah. seen a team that was fifth worst in the NHL, but uh, whenever, but the Bell Center was rocking. Was yeah. Bell Center was rocking every night. Would you imagine uh, if Garfield was still there at the end of the season? Oh my God. Well, I'm not uh, saying we will make the playoff, but just the but, show and everything. Well, that's it. He was worth the price of admission, you know. Oh, It's yeah. like the, with the way he, he's shooting the puck 10 times a game. I would go see that. No problem. Yeah. Um, Mitch, thank you very much for joining me. Thank uh, you. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully the next time we speak, we'll be breaking down the uh, first over, first. Uh, first round pick, maybe both picks. Who knows how far down the line it will be, but this was very, very fun. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. That was Mitch Jaguar, Uh, And I am Matt O'Hayan. Thank you for listening to the SICK Podcast. Again, pre-recording some weeks. Some, some days we go live. Sometimes we won't in the summer. It's all dependent on our guest schedules, and we want to bring you the best content that we possibly can. So we're going to cater to our guests' schedules. All right. Thank you very much. So much. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Enjoy Grand Prix weekend if you're in Montreal. Take care. Have a good weekend. I'm off next week, so Tony's filling in. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.